Excuse me for a minute, I'm just trying to pull this up. Okay, we're gonna talk about sauces. Now, you've seen the videos on the mother sauces. The mother sauces we said were the foundation of all French cooking or the foundation of cooking. So the modern chef uses pan juices and pan reductions and the drippings to fortify their sauces. So in today's braise, the recipe calls for braising in chicken stock or the braised pork. If we had pork stock, which we would make from roasting of pork bones, add mirepoix, get the bones nice and get the bones nice and brown, then add tomato product, brown it up a little bit more, add water, let that simmer, we'd have a really nice brown pork stock. Then if you drain the bones, you would reduce that pork stock to a syrup consistency, and that's a pork demi. This would be used in a uh, traditional braise, but most restaurants do not have pork stock, but we always have chicken stock available. That's just a common cooking item that you have available in restaurants. So the modern chef will use reductions, pan drippings to make their sauces. So we, um, last week we talked about uh, using the roux and we said the cooking time of the roux determines which sauce that it's used in. The longer you cook the roux, the more you cook out the floury flavor, the more color will add to the roux, but also the longer you cook the roux for like a brown roux, the less thickening power you have because you're breaking down the gluten. The gluten is the protein which is used to um, thicken the sauce. So um, the leading sauces we talked about, white stock, having a, a white color of stock using white roux, the term for velouté in French means velvet, so it's going to have a velvet consistency. And in one of your definitions, you had the term nappé. Nappé means to coat the, saw, the back of a spoon with sauce or a liquid. It means if I take the ladle and I put it in the sauce, put it in and turn it upside down, it'll run smoothly or evenly along the ladle. The rule of thumb is 10 to 12 ounces of roux per gallon for nappé. Nappé, French term, meaning to coat the back of a spoon with sauce or uh, aspic. Uh, a thick super sauce, you'd want one pound of roux. So when we're talking chowders and bisque, we use about a pound. Uh, tempering, which is this right uh, screen here, means to make the roux the same temperature as the hot liquid, combining them both together and then bringing to a simmer. And when you bring it to a simmer, the gelatin and the protein coagulates. So bread flour, um, when you add it to a fat and you cook it and then temper it, when it expands in the heat, it thickens. And that's how it, it gets thickened. So today we can do, uh, in a braise, you can use a brown roux because you want to keep the brown color, a blonde roux if you want it to be a lute color, and since we're adding a lio liaison today, no roux, but we're adding a liaison, which is egg and cream, that helps to enrich in, but slightly thicken. So what chefs will do is they'll take the braising liquid, they'll drain it out in a separate pan, let it reduce a little bit, then they'll add the, then they'll add the liaison to thicken. So there is no right and wrong way to thicken, until you taste the product. So you don't want a starchy product. You don't want a floury product. You don't want a product that's so gummy thick tasting and that's from the protein and the gelatin. Um, so what we're looking for is for a nice silk smoothie product. Now we said in some pan gravies, you're gonna use a slurry. The slurry is a whitewash. Whitewash is flour and water, cornstarch and water, or arrowroot. Arrowroot comes from a root of a particular product or plant. Arrowroot is a little bit more expensive. It's used in a lot of baking ingredients because it holds up well in the freezer, but it also adds a lot of shine. So any starch 
that you use has to be dissolved in fat or water. Cornstarch is always dissolved in water, stock, or wine, but it has to be cold. You cannot take cornstarch and dump it powder form directly into the hot liquid. It'll just pump up and it'll thicken, and then you, you can't use it. Whenever we add starches, roux, or slurry, the liquid always has to be simmering at least 180 degrees. The reason why is most starches expand between 170 to 180. Starches have different uh, temperatures they, they expand. A good example of seeing how something gelatinized or starches is when you um, are baking bread and you use steam in an oven. And on top of the bread, when you're using steam in the oven, you're seeing the little bubbles on top of the bread that is the water bubbles, but they look thick. That's gelatin from the protein in the gluten in the flour. So when making Italian breads and French breads, you see that on top of the bread. And that's what forms your crust. That's why when you bake French or Italian bread, you shouldn't put it in a plastic bag. You should leave it out in the open, uh, storing it in a basket or putting it in a paper bag so it doesn't become sponge-like uh, and retain moisture. The same as if you think of flours. Flours have different amounts of gluten. Bread flour will be high gluten. Cake or pastry flour will be low gluten. The reason why is in bread flours, you want them stiff, you want them firm and crunchy. Pastries like cake or Danish or um, certain types of pastries, you do not want the gluten to develop. You want them delicate like in a cake, so that's low gluten. That's why I'll say cake flour. Many of you don't know that all-purpose flour is a combination of bread and cake. And depending on the manufacturer, it depends on the ratio. Usually it's 60% bread and 40% uh, cake flour, and that's why they call it all-purpose. You could use it for everything. But in restaurants, especially with bakers or pastry chefs, they want the different flours. They want to control the amount of gluten. When I had my bakery, I had high gluten flour, specifically for French bread and Italian bread. I had pastry and cake flour specifically for pastries. So the same goes with your thickening agent. If you understand this concept, when you make your roux, you have to understand that that protein is gonna thicken your product. The longer I brown the bread flour and get it darker, the harder it is to thicken and it takes more roux to thicken. If you get lumps, you wanna strain it. When you take cream and eggs and mix them together for liaison, you have to temper first. You can't directly pour it into a simmering liquid because it's just like your coffee. If you have a cup of coffee and you would add, add cold cream to it, it coagulates and it separates. Most of your response will be, um, the cream is no good. Well, that's not necessarily true because if you have a hot cup of coffee and you're putting the cream in, it coagulates. What's happening is that butter fat is coagulating right away. Um, so that's why uh, we uh, make sure we temper. We take the hot braising liquid, no meat or anything in it, just the liquid, put it into the egg and cream. We go back and forth until they're the same temperature. Then we stir everything together back in with the meat. We finish with our sauce and then, then, we are, uh, then we're done. Okay, so I know most of you have watched the, the uh, video on the leading sauces, leading sauces are our mother sauces. Remember bechamel is the first one, which is a white sauce. So in the bechamel, this is our foundation of all cream sauces. So if I wanna make a cheese sauce and I add cheese to this, it's called a Mornay. Uh, cheddar would make it more of a yellow color. If I take vinegar and mustard and combine that together with my dry ingredients for making the uh, mustard, it's called a mustard sauce. Subis is sweated onions, and we would strain the onions out. Nantois is just the same process as making a bisque. It's going to be a white bechamel or a white velouté. Now, when we make our soups, you either follow the bechamel method or the velouté method. So uh, bechamel would be a mother sauce, but it's also a soup technique. Uh, velouté is a mother sauce, but it's also a soup technique. So what that means is if I take my vegetables and I sweat them, 
in fact, in the other day when we did the braids, I gave you an example and I showed you a picture. And it's, I said, this is a compound roux. A compound roux means a complex roux. This is a roux with vegetables. Instead of dirtying up many pans in the kitchen, we will take one pan, sweat our vegetables. Sweat means to cook vegetables until they're translucent under cover. I sweat my vegetables. Once I have the onions translucent, I dust with flour. When I dust with flour, I'm creating a roux. This roux is known as a compound roux. So this is used in braising and in soup techniques. If I wanted a cream of broccoli soup, I'm gonna take the broccoli stems, cut them up, put them in with white mirepoix, which is celery and onion, I'm gonna sweat them. I dust with flour, I measure the amount of flour out that I need to create my thickening. So if I'm using a gallon of liquid, I'm gonna use 12 ounces of flour, six ounces of clarified butter, six ounces of flour. I dust my broccoli stems that are chopped, my white onion and my celery. And some people might use the white elite. So I dust that. All those created together are compound roux. Now you could take this roux and puree it and then add your hot stock to it. And you're gonna have a cream of broccoli base. If I just add a bunch of vegetables to it and then I puree my roux, it's a cream of vegetable base. These are all base roux. Or I could simply take my broccoli stems, white onion and celery, dust with flour, add my stock to it. Then I would have a, a, a liquid. And in the kitchen, we have a handheld uh, mixer. You simply take this big mixer. It looks like a, a drill with a handle on it. Put it in the pot and you hit it and it'll puree all your large chunks and pieces right in the pot. Then you'll have the base for a cream of broccoli or a base of cream of vegetable soup. Then I simply add a liaison of just cream, tempered cream. I have steamed broccoli florets that I would garnish the soup with and that would be my cream of broccoli. If I was doing vegetable, I would have a brunoise of steamed vegetable and that would be my garnish of vegetable. So let's say we wanted to make a cream of uh, mushroom. I would take my mushroom stems, chop them up. I would have white onion, a little bit of celery, white mirepoix. Some people like to use a little bit of white alique, add my white to it, sweat them until the onions are translucent, dust with flour, six ounces of butter, six ounces of uh, butter, six ounces of flour, add that to those vegetables with the mushroom stems. That would be my base for my mushroom, cream of mushroom base roux, compound roux. I can either put the roux into a food processor and puree it, or I can add my stock to it, bring it to a simmer, add a handheld mixer to it, puree it, and that's my base of cream of mushroom. Then I take my mushrooms and I lightly so slice them and lightly saute them, add them to the soup, and then I have a cream of mushroom soup. This is the standard for classical French cream soups. If it's bechamel, I'm using milk. If it's velouté, I'm using stock. The restaurant industry uses velouté because we like to hold, make our soups a day ahead, hold them, and then add our cream to them as we need them when we serve them. If you use milk, milk has a tendency to sour and go bad or curdle when you reheat it. So that's why we don't use bechamel. Um, so bechamel is one of your foundation sauces, but it's also your technique for making cream soups. If you remember in my rest, in my first lecture, I told you that when you complete your program in the cooking labs, you should be able to cover the method up, look at the ingredients and create the recipe. So with what I just told you in the preparation for a cream soup, you should be able to take any cream soup, cover up the method and know how to make it. It's always going to have a vegetable, some type of vegetable base, which we call white mirepoix, and a thickening agent, which is flour and fat. If you use flour and oil, if you want healthy, you use olive oil. Some recipes, if you want them a little more flavorful, they use pork fat rendered out, but it's always fat, and you always have to dissolve your flour or starch in a liquid. Okay, so that is your velouté method. Okay, so um, Tomato, we're going to make uh, in class on a regular basis when we get into 
quantity and international, we're gonna make the Italian variation. Uh, Spanish or Spain, just know that we made that. That's, that's the um, concasse, concasse. Creole, Creole is, follows the velouté method, which it does have a roux, a traditional Creole tomato sauce, renders out pork fat, they add their vegetables, Sanger, a singer with flour. Then you add veal, veal stock, which is white veal stock. Then you add crushed tomato and let it simmer, and then you puree. Classical French tomato has a roux, and that's from the Cajun Creole, known as a Creole sauce in Low Country, which is New Orleans. Most of us will be either doing the um, tomato concasse, which is sauce Provençal, the Italian variation of tomato sauce, which we'll learn in international and in quantity or you'll be doing what's called a marinara. Marinara is literally translated, it means of the marina or of the sea. A traditional classical marinara tomato sauce had um, uh, anchovies in it as the base for sauteing your vegetables. Anchovies have a lot of fat. Now, many of you may not like anchovies, but just like a, a chowder was created in a large caldron on an open vessel on a sea ship uh, out on the sea, it's no cream though, it's just rough cut vegetables and fish thrown in a pot, that's a chowder. Well, marinara was the same way. They, in Italy and Sicily, they had a lot of tomato product. So when they're out fishing, they had a lot of sea and they fished a lot of schmelz and um, small sardines in um, Sicily and they throw them in a pot with chopped tomato and cook it quickly. And this became their base tomato sauce was known as marinara. Marinara is seafood in Italian. Uh, or marina, marina meaning seafood. So it's a la minute type of sauce. It's chunky, it takes 45 minutes. You throw it together, you let it simmer, you add some seasoning at the end, and that's, that's simply what marinara means. Okay, so um, next week we're going to be making a hollandaise sauce. And a hollandaise sauce is an emulsification. We're gonna be taking cooked egg yolks, suspending with the fatty substance of butter, and then, um, we're gonna add flavoring ingredients, which would be a, a reduction of either uh, tarragon, tarragon vinegar, black peppercorns, shallots, which is from the onion family, a shallot is sweet. And then we're going to poach some fish and we're gonna add vernays or hollandaise sauce on top of that. And I'm going to demonstrate that. So these are your foundation sauces. Now, most chefs today, as I said, will be doing reductions, um, which means they reduce the cooking of a seared meat, a braised meat, they reduce it to get more flavor. When you reduce, the natural moistures evaporate and then you have a thick um, flavored sauce. Um, so any questions?